Hi everyone, uh, wanted to talk a little bit more about Bitcoin today because uh, it's been all I've talked about for eight years. And uh, today uh, I have open on the screen here a copy of the Bitcoin Wiki that was linked from directly from Bitcoin.org. Uh, the date that I have happened to have open is um, May of 2013 from the Internet Archive. Um, the content would be pretty same, if pretty similar if you'd looked at it in 2012 or 11 or 2010 or even 2014 and probably into 2015 for that matter. Um, and it's talking about scalability of Bitcoin. And uh, again, this is right from the, the official, unofficial Bitcoin wiki. Uh, and we'll get right into it here. So uh, the title is Scalability, and uh, it says uh, the core Bitcoin network can scale to much higher transaction rates than are seen today. Assuming that nodes in the network are primarily running on high-end servers rather than desktops, Bitcoin was designed to support lightweight clients that, not, uh, that only process small parts of the blockchain. See Simplified Payment Verification, also known as SPV, uh, below for more details on this. A configuration in which the vast majority of users sync lightweight clients to more powerful backbone nodes is capable of scaling to millions of users and tens of thousands of transactions per second. So what he's talking about, whoever wrote this, what they're talking about are, are wallets like uh, Bread Wallet and, and a, you know almost every app for iPhone that's actually a Bitcoin wallet rather than a Bitcoin bank like Coinbase or, or Zappo uh, is using an SPV wallet. Uh, there's some other ones that are hybrids as well, like uh, blockchain.info and, and some others there. But uh, anyhow, uh, it goes on to scalability targets. That sounds like really fun to talk about. And it says... Uh, Visa, Visa handles, on average, around 2,000 transactions per second. So call it a daily peak rate of 4,000 transactions per second. They have burst capacity for over 10,000 transactions per second, which they need to handle the busiest po uh, points of the holiday period, which there's a link citing it's around 8,500 transactions per second. PayPal, in contrast, handles around 4 million transactions per day for an average of 46 transactions per second, or probably a peak rate of around 100 transactions per second. So let's take 4,000 transactions per second as a starting goal. And keep in mind that Bitcoin today, BTC, is doing about three transactions per second maximum. Um, Bitcoin Cash can already do in the ballpark of uh, 100 transactions per second on chain. Uh, but again, this is back from May of 2013 before there was any such thing as Bitcoin Core or Bitcoin uh, Cash. So anyhow, 4,000 transactions per second is the starting goal. Obviously, if you want Bitcoin to scale to all economic transactions worldwide, including cash, it would be a lot higher than that, perhaps more in the region of a few hundred thousand transactions per second, and the need to be able to withstand denial of service attacks, which Visa does not have to deal with, uh, implies that we would want to scale far beyond the standard peak rates. Still, picking a target, uh, let us do some basic calculations, even if it's a little arbitrary. So it talks about the current bottlenecks to hitting 4,000 transactions per second from the 3,000 transactions per second that we have today. Uh, I'm sorry, three, three transactions per second uh, today. Um, so the first bottleneck on the list here is a CPU, right? So it says, uh, the protocol has two parts. Nodes send uh, INV messages to other nodes telling them they have a new transaction. If the receiving node doesn't have the transaction, it requests it with a get data. The big uh, cost is the crypto and blockchain lookups uh, involved in verifying the transaction. Verifying a transaction means some hashing and some ECDSA signature verifications. Uh, RIP EMD-160 runs at 106 megabytes per second, called 100 for simplicity, and SHA-256 is about the same. So hashing one megabyte should take around 10 milliseconds and hashing one kilobyte would take around 0 0.001 milliseconds, fast enough that we can ignore it. So a 0 0.01 milliseconds is really, really uh, not a very big amount of time. So uh, anyhow, Bitcoin is currently able, with a couple of simple optimizations that are prototype but not merged yet, uh, to perform around 8,000 signature verifications per second on a quad-core Intel i7-2670QM, 2.2 gigahertz processor. So. If you're like me, I don't know by heart what, what the specs are of that. I know i7s are pretty decent, but uh, anyhow, I took the time to look up the details for that specific uh, processor that uh, 
back in 2013 when this was written, uh, it can do 8,000 signature verifications per second. Uh, well, the average number of uh, inputs per transaction is around two, so we must uh, have the rate. This means 4,000 transactions per second is e easily achievable CPU-wise with a single fairly mainstream CPU. Um, so anyhow, that CPU, I looked it up here, here we go. It was released in Q4 of 2011. Here's the part number for it, right? So it has four cores, eight threads, 2.2 gigahertz is the standard clock speed, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and I've pulled up this page here that shows uh, high-end CPUs updated as of today, July 4th. So happy, uh, happy Independence Day, by the way, to all the people uh, in the US there. So. If we uh, search for this particular CPU, there it is. You can see that its ranking is 5,901, and currently it says $259 for that, but I was checking the price history elsewhere. It looks like it hit less than $100, so it's probably some legacy CPU, and they're charging more for it. So anyhow, $259 for it scores 5,900 points in here. If you scroll up quite a bit, all right, up and up and up. And so here we go. So here's here's a newer i7, right? $399, similar ballpark, 11,000, right? So a similar a similar CPU today to what that one cost just a few years ago now can do, you know, well over double. Uh, and if we click on it, there's probably even more, uh, it's probably even more impressive. So anyhow, CPUs have gotten much more powerful than in 2013 when this was originally uh, uh, written. Um, so anyhow, it goes on to say, whoever wrote this, they, uh, as we can see, this means as long as Bitcoin nodes are allowed to max out at least four cores of the machines uh, they run on, we will not run out of CPU capacity unless Bitcoin is handling 100 times as much traffic as PayPal. As of late 2012, the network is handling half a transaction per second. Today, uh, what, seven, six years later, after late 2012, uh, it's handling about three transactions per second. Um, and earlier, I think it said that PayPal does uh, 46 transactions per second. So here we are, we're saying they can do uh, over 100 times as much as PayPal. So PayPal, 46 transactions per second, uh, what, 4,600 transactions per second are, are possible there? Like... And today, Bitcoin is doing three transactions per second for Bitcoin Core. <clears throat> um, anyhow, we go on to network transactional throughput. Uh, so it says, let's assume an average transaction rate of 2,000 transactions per second. So about 1,000 times more than what Bitcoin Core is doing at the moment, right? Compared to, it's, it's doing two or three transactions per second at the moment. So 1,000 times more than that. Uh, so let's assume it's the average trans rate of 2,000 transactions per second. So just Visa. Transactions vary in size from about 0.2 kilobytes to over one kilobyte, but it's averaging half a kilobyte today, and I think it probably still averages about that today amongst all the different transactions on the network. That means that you need to, go, uh, need to keep up with around eight megabits per second of transaction data, right? 2,000 transactions times half a kilobyte equals, uh, equals about a megabyte uh, per second. Right, so that means uh, just under eight megabits per second is the internet connection speed you need to have. So this sort of bandwidth is already common for uh, even residential connections today and is certainly at the low end of what uh, co-location providers would expect to provide you. So I'm recording this video in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in uh, St. Kitts and for a very reasonable price per month, I have 50 megabits down and 10 megabits up. Uh, in Tokyo, for even cheaper than I'm paying in St. Kitts, actually. So in Tokyo, for like th about 30 US dollars, 28 US dollars a month, I have two gigabits, right? 2,000 megabits up and down. And uh, most major cities around the world, you can get like gigabit internet connections now that are you know less than 100 US dollars a month. Uh, in Asia, you're looking at somewhere in the ballpark of you know $30 a month, certainly less than $50 a month. Uh, anyhow, and if you're in a data center, you know, I think 100 meg connections uh, up and down is like the starting point at this point. Uh, in, in fact, it's probably even, you know, gig, gig connections uh, at this point. So anyhow, um, you need 8 megabits per second worth of bandwidth to keep up with Visa. So um, this sort of bandwidth is always common, or is already common. 
When blocks are solved, the current protocol will send the transaction again, even if a peer has already seen it at, uh, at broadcast time. Fixing this to make blocks just a list of hashes would resolve the issue and make the bandwidth needed for block broadcast negligible. So they were writing this back in 2013. Uh, what they're talking about there already exists and has been implemented in you know, Bitcoin Unlimited, Bitcoin ABC, Bitcoin Core. Uh, they all have it. It's uh, ultra thin block or extreme thin blocks. And I think they call it fast blocks on Bitcoin Core. Um, but anyhow, that's all been uh, implemented so they don't have to rebroadcast the block again when a, a block is found. Um, so it says, at the time this was written, it says, so whilst this optimization isn't fully implemented today, we do not consider block transmission bandwidth here. Problem was solved between the time they wrote this and today. So next on our list here, storage. At very high transaction rates, uh, each block can be over half a gigabyte in size. It is not required for most fully validating nodes to store the entire chain. In Satoshi's white paper, he describes pruning, a way to delete unnecessary data about transactions that are fully spent. This reduces the amount of data that is needed for a fully validating node to be only the size of the current uh, UTXO set or unspent output size, plus some additional data that is needed to handle reorgs. As of October 2012, block number 203,000 and some change, there have been 7 million 900 and blah, 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 thousand transactions. However, the size of unspent, unspent output set is less than 100 megabytes, which is small enough to easily fit in RAM, even for quite old computers. So to be fair, it's a bit bigger today. Um, but uh, it says only a small number of archival nodes uh, need to store the full chain, going back to the Genesis block. These nodes can be used to bootstrap new fully validating nodes from scratch, but are otherwise unnecessary. So you're saying every node doesn't have to have a full and complete copy of the entire blockchain. You can just have some archival nodes that have it all that are there ready to seed it for new nodes that come online and want a whole copy of it. And that's how probably 99% of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency users today are not running full nodes. They're using a service like blockchain.info or Coinbase or Zappo or even the Bitcoin.com wallet uh, for that matter, right? We're running a full node uh, for our users' behalf. And the, the users still control their private keys and, and that's, that's plenty good enough. Uh, so it says the primary limiting factor in Bitcoin's performance is disk seeks once the unspit uh, transaction output set starts fitting, uh, stop, stops fitting in memory. It is quite possible that the set will always fit in memory on dedicated server class machines if hardware advances faster than Bitcoin usage does. So um, I have some more stuff queued up here for you guys here. So we can see, uh oh, no data points. The one graph I wanted out of the four is missing. So let's refresh the page and get it there. And we can see that the UTXO set at the moment is about 2.6 gigabytes. Um, 2.6 gigabytes, okay. Well, uh, here's what I wanted to show you guys. Um, the UTX data set for, for Bitcoin Core today is 2.6 gigabytes. Google Chrome on my computer uses more memory than the entire UTXO data set for Bitcoin Core. So uh, obviously not a problem. If my computer can run Bitcoin Core, it can run, I'm sorry, if it can run Google Chrome, it can, and this is just a laptop, right? It's, it's a decent MacBook Pro laptop, right? Uh, and it's worth pointing out that these people that are actually running mining pools um, are spending you know, thousands of dollars a month on the hardware, if not tens of thousands of dollars a month. And anybody that's a miner, they're ordering millions of dollars of equipment at a time to do the mining, right? They can afford to buy it, you know, a single, the, the cost of one single, you know, decent mining rig can buy what was a supercomputer just a few years ago with 128 gigs of RAM. So we've been buying servers that we're hosting our stuff. We've been buying a generation eight uh, uh, Dell server. Sorry, it's getting late and I've been doing Bitcoin all, all day. And you can go and look on Amazon. They're like uh, less than $2,000 with 128 gigs of like DDR3 memory and you know, awesome Intel Xeon CPUs and like, they were definitely supercomputers just a, a couple of years ago and uh, still pretty darn nice machines. And using purse.io, you can get a 20% discount on them. So anyhow, the, the, the worry about UTXO set, you know, bloat. Google Chrome is using more memory on my computer than uh, the entire UTXO set of, uh, of Bitcoin. So 
Um, so that goes on to some additional optimizations here that can be made. So it says uh, the description above applies to the current software with only minor optimizations. Uh, assumed uh, that the type uh, that can and have been done by one man in a few weeks. However, there is a potential for even greater optimizations to be made in the future at the cost of some additional complexity. So it goes on to say, uh, Peter Whaley, right? And Peter uh, has done a lot of really, really neat things for Bitcoin. So kudos, kudos to P Peter. Uh, I wish he would have spoken out against the censorship, but he doesn't really talk to anybody outside of the mailing list about anything. And that's totally respectable. Arguing about censorship on the internet is not so fun, uh, especially if you have your you know, nose in code. Uh, anyhow, Peter uh, has implemented a custom verified uh, tuned, uh, verifier tune for SEP, SECP 256K1 that can go beyond 20,000 signature verifications per second. Uh, it would require careful review by professional cryptographers to gain as much confidence as OpenSSL, but can easily have CPU load. And, and I believe that's already been merged and it's being used on both Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash as of a couple of years ago now. Um, so nice job uh, on that, guys. Um, the newly developed digital signature algorithms like ED25519 have extremely efficient software implementations that can reach speeds of nearly 80,000 verifications per sec second, even on old Westmere CPU. That is a 10 times improvement over the uh, SecP256K1 and most likely is even higher on more modern CPUs, right? And this was written back in 2013, so of course it's even higher on, on newer CPUs that came out between now and then. So he goes on to say, supporting this in Bitcoin would mean a soft fork like the one done recently for pay to script hash support. Algorithms exist to accelerate batch verification over elliptic curved signatures. This means uh, if there are several inputs uh, that are signing with the same key, it is possible to check their signature simultaneously for another nine times speed up. This is a somewhat more complex implementation. However, it can work with existing signatures. Clients don't need upgrading. And uh, I don't know offhand if that's already been implemented in the last couple of years or not. Uh, it very well may have been. Uh, assuming no upgrades to lightweight SPV clients, so just batch verification, we can reach 40,000 thousand transactions per second, which is far beyond traffic levels of the entire credit card system. And with ED25519, we could go up to nearly half a million transactions per second with today's hardware. Let's go over that again. You can go up to nearly half a million transactions per second with today's hardware. And this was written in 2013. So today's hardware in 2018 is much, much, much better than the hardware back in 2013. So at, speeds, uh, at these speeds, it is likely that bandwidth to disk would become the primary limiting factor. And uh, it goes on to talk about some SPV stuff. So let's talk about the bandwidth to disk being the primary limiting factor. Well, uh, I pulled up some other interesting things. So around the time this article was written, DDR2 or DDR3 were the most common types of memory. And if we look at the DDR2 on Wikipedia here, if we scroll down, we can see uh, the transfer rate here, right? So you're looking for the base you know, speed, DDR2, 400. Peak transfer rate is 32 megabits per second. Uh, maybe. And if we look here at the latest uh, M.2 drives, you can see it's in the same ballpark, right? So hard disk drives are almost as fast as memory that was in use. Uh, DDR2 came out initially uh, it's released in 2000, but it was wi it's still widely used in some older systems, but uh, it was widely used for a long, long, long time. Uh, and it was probably in 2013, I'd have to do some more Googling, but it was probably the, the most or second most common form of memory. Uh, in fact, this 2018 MacBook Pro uh, is using low power DDR3 today. So here we are in 2018 and DDR3 is still really, really common stuff. So anyhow, uh, hard drives, right, are getting almost as fast as memory uh, was back at the time that this was written. So uh, anyhow, this is on the original Bitcoin Wiki back in 2013 before the censorship started, describing how Bitcoin with existing hardware in 2013 could scale to half a million transactions per second on chain. And yet, a bunch of people are gauging in a bunch of censorship claiming that uh, we have to limit it to three transactions per second on chain. 
using censorship to do so. Uh, anyhow, just absolutely insane. That's why I'm a supporter of Bitcoin Cash because it scales to be money for the world and the people behind it don't support censorship because Bitcoin is supposed to be censorship resistant money. Hope you guys found uh, this video interesting. Uh, just want to mention, uh, if you like it, subscribe to the channel, share this video with a friend. Uh, remember that our Bitcoin, bitcointalk.org, bitcoin.org are all completely censored by uh, the same guy, Thamos. Bitcoin is supposed to be censorship resistant money. So if you're engaging in censorship, you're an enemy of Bitcoin, Thamos. Um, and uh, if you don't believe me about the censorship on our Bitcoin, uh, go and post a link to this video and you can see for yourself. And I'm very clearly talking about Bitcoin. Uh, this is from the original Bitcoin wiki back in 2013 before there were any, uh, basically any altcoins at all at that point. I think Litecoin uh, was probably the only, the only altcoin going at that time. So anyhow, thank you guys for watching. Share the video with a friend and uh, visit Bitcoin.com. Uh, go there to learn more and subscribe to the channel for more videos. See you next time. Good night.